you haven't noticed by now, Pastor Mike is not here. Um, I am not the darker, better looking version of him. He's an altogether different person. Uh, so we're going to make do with what we have. <laughs> we're going to make do with what we have. And we'll praise God. So I'm going to be continuing the, the series we started on the seven churches of the book of Revelation. So if you open your Bibles to that point, we'll get started. And as you're finding your place, I'll, I'll put us in a position to start. You know, the important thing to remember here as we're going through this study today is the context for its happening. That's the thing we have to remember. It is so easy for us in our 21st century mindset to be removed from the idea of the battle, the spiritual battle. You've heard me mention that a few times this morning. And nowhere is that more important than when we study in the book of the Revelation. We have a tendency in two main camps of thought to put the majority of these things in the past haven't already occurred, or we stick them so far in the future that they don't have any implications or impact on our life today. Both of those views are wrong. Everything in the word of God is for right here, right now, today. We need to live it out today. So as we're studying these, uh, these letters, I want to encourage you to look at the impact of the application for right now, for today. So today we're going to be studying the fourth church of the seven. Uh, this one is the church of Thyatira. Now, as I began to do some study and, and background search on this church, uh, the name was not as distinctly defined as some of the other churches were. The church of Thyatira seems to have two main meanings. The concept of one is being the castle of, Thy of Tyra, or uh, this stronghold, and the other one is a sacrifice of labor. But when I began to study the church, those two things seemed to come in together to make sense. Uh, it was a str uh, the stronghold, economic stronghold of its time. It was the home of all the trade guilds, and one of the trade guilds there, of course, was the dye guild. And uh, that's where we get the whole idea of the purple cloth that was made. We have uh, Lystra, I think was her name. The sister that was mentioned back in the book of Acts is believed to have come from the church of Thyatira. So this name holds within it the key for the things that God is going to do in the church, its needs, and also its troubles. And what we want to do is get a little back, we'll back up a little bit, get a running start and come forward. The first church, of course, was the church of Ephesus. Its name, if you remember, it means the desired one. And its message was to repent and return to its first love. The second church was the church of Smyrna, which means to suffer, and it was encouraged to persevere. The third church was Pergamos, and it, was, it meant married to the world, compromise, a church of compromise. So we have these three churches. God says, first, return to your first love. You are my desired one, return to your first love. The second one said, since you are now returned to your first love, you are enduring hardships and suffering because of your confession of faith, stand fast, do not compromise. The third one says, Pergamos, we saw the downward digression, which is so often the truth about our lives, is that it married itself to the world. And the word of God to the church was separate, come back and be uh, submitted to the word of God. Now today we come to the church of Thyatira, and as I see it, there is the twofold meaning of his name. One is the works of the flesh, and the second is the tolerance of evil. So if we think about this as a concept, God tells us uh, first our desired one to suffer, do not compromise, and then he tells us to not be tolerant of evil not to be tolerant of evil. So as we go forward, we want to just look at this and think about how this applies in our own lives. So if we listen to the name, as I did, when we concentrate on the name of the church, it seems to me to speak of that very concept. An economic stronghold, a very popular city, didn't have many things to worry about. And so as a result of that, it slowly became tolerant because it was popular. It was, everything was working well for it. And when things are going real well for you sometimes, you don't want to do things to make that get messed up. You let things slip and slide so you don't lose your good things, so to speak. And so this is the caution. So let's turn our Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read verses 28 through 29. We'll read this and just then we'll go back and go through the word. I'm sorry, 18 through 29. What am I saying? 18 through 29. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like brass. 
I know thy works and thy charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that, ye, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall, he, shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit, Lord God. And we thank you that you've given us truth now to guide us and to lead us in the way of righteousness. And no more, nowhere more, Lord, uh, is that need right now. We need you, Father, to speak to us. Bless the speaker this morning. Help me, Lord God, to be faithful to your word. Help your children to hear your truths and then help us all to live it. We thank you for it in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Okay, as we go forward again, I want to, again, kind of disperse some of the mysticism that seems to circle this book. One of the first things I want to say to you is, again, remember that Jesus gave this letter to us that for the purpose of using it today. There seems to be this idea that floats around in the church that the book of Revelation cannot be understood, that somehow it is a closed book. And that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible says about it. You have the ability through the power of God to understand everything written in the book of the Revelation. You have to trust the spirit of God and know that it's there. Now, the enemy will all the time come and try to get you to do one of two things. One, to ignore his existence, and two, to believe that God's a liar. So we have to come back to this point and say, Lord, we believe that your word is true. James, and, and I gave you a little note, then James chapter four gives us a little hint of the James four, seven, says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So as we go into our study, we have to approach it with that same mindset, that we have to submit ourselves to God. Lord, your word is true. What you say about me is true. Your word is true. And then once we hold ourselves that, we then resist the enemy. And once we're standing in truth, the enemy has no choice but to flee from us. Also, we want to come back with this idea that we, we don't want to be uh, circling our camps. Uh, this is one of those books, again, that has so many different points of, of interpretation that it's so easy for us to find those who think like we do, circle our wagons, and then begin fighting. The problem is, is that we wind up fighting each other instead of fighting the devil. So hold your dogmas loosely, read the word, trust the word, and be faithful to God. Because the thing we want to remember when it comes to the book of Revelation is this, is that what Jesus has said is going to happen is going to happen. And what we have to do, regardless of which camp you find yourself falling in, is you have to today live ready. Live ready to be a witness of the living God. Live ready to be a blessing to your brothers and sisters. Live ready and, and not be, be suckered into taking shots one at another. Okay, we're almost ready. We're getting there. Uh, just kind of giving us that running start up. When we get to the book of the Revelation, it's important again to understand that Jesus gave John a very specific way to look at the book. He gave him an outline. He said in chapter one that I want you to do three things. I want you to write down the things that have happened. So the things that John had already experienced, he's record that in the beginning of this book. Then he says, I want you to write down the things that are now happening. And then he gave him these seven letters. And then he said, I want you to write down the things that will happen hereafter, those things that happen after those letters. So we have that breakdown that he gave us those three epochs in history to look at and see how we would see the things of God working its way out. Now, we come to the church of Thyatira. There are 12 verses dedicated to this, this, this letter uh, of these 
uh, 12 verses. They are broken down into six subsections of study. This is what we'll be looking at today. The first one is the revelation of the character of Jesus as it pertains to this particular church. The second one will be the commendation of Christ of the church and the intimacy of Christ's knowledge of his people. Third will be the rebuke of the Lord. Uh, the fourth one will be the behind the scenes, the action of the Lord. And the next will be the encouragement to the faithful and finally the promise of reward. And then when we finish this, uh, this view, I'm going to come back and look at those six points again. And we want you to apply it to your own life and ask yourself the question, how do these six things stack up in your life? It's all fine and dandy that they stacked up for the church of Thyatira, but how do they work in your life today? That's what we want to look at. Everybody ready? All right, all right. Uh, to whom is the letter addressed and who is it from? Verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira the, uh, write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. When we go back into chapter 1 of Revelation, we see in verses 13 through 16, where John catches a glimpse of the resurrected Jesus, the glorified Lord. And we see this presentation of God there. And he sees this. Now, what I, I want you to get out of this, again, because this is going to be very important as we look at this letter. When John turned and saw the glorified Jesus, he had a very particular reaction. Anybody remember what that reaction was? He fell down as if dead, right? So there was this overwhelming awe of the person of God. And why I bring that out to you today is because I think sometimes it's possible for us as a church to become too handsy with Jesus. Sometimes we get to the place where we think of him as our big brother, which he is. And we think of him as our friend, which he is. But sometimes I think that gets us to the point where we forget that he's also our Lord, that he's also our God. And so when John, <clears throat> one of his closest earthly friends, who was close enough to Jesus that during the Last Supper, he laid against his breast. When he turned around and looked at the glorified Lord, it wasn't like he was going, oh, what's up, G? What's happening? No, it was, oh my gosh, this is the glory of God. And he fell down as if dead. So now, it's amazing to me, or interesting to me, that this is the persona that Jesus used to identify himself to the church of Thyatira. It suggests to him, to me, that he's conveying this thought for a purpose. And as I look at myself, I ask the same question, how am I reacting to the presence of God? So Jesus used this part, he identified himself as the son of God. Now, if you think about the church of Thyatira, this is a business hub. This is like New York or LA. All the business of the area comes to it. These people are very secure. They're very strong in who they are. They have their ranks. They have their authority. They have the, the guilds that are there. And all these guilds are powerful. I mean, they have their structure. They have, it's like the, the unions of today. These guys, they know what they're doing. And so the Lord comes in. He says, but behold, guys, I know you got all this power, but I am the son of God. So he identifies to them that he is supreme over all these business things, of all these power structures. He is over all of that. And then he suggests to them, he says, he has eyes of fire and feet like brass. And we know that when we talk about the fire, we talk about purification as a symbol in the Bible. And we talk about brass as in judgment. So here he comes now and he says to the church of Thyatira, and he says to you and he says to me this morning, I'm God. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter where you are in your life, understand that I am the Son of God. There is no higher authority than me. As you look at and checking your balances and getting all these things in order and making sure you're in line with this gill and that gill and this combination, all these things that you're doing, don't forget that I am God. And as the church was operating within this system, the church began to absorb or take on some of these characteristics. And because they took on these characteristics, like the guilds where they work together and they do different things for cooperation, they began to cooperate with the spirit of Satan in a way that Jesus calls them out on. And so what you and I have to look at today in our life is, is God still Lord? Or have we substituted a set of rules and regulations that allows the enemy to have leeway in our life? The Bible tells us that Jesus looked at them with the eyes of fire. What he did is he was able to look through all the smoke and, 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 and screens that were up, all the confusions and self-deceptions, all of these structures he put in place and he saw right to the heart of what was going on. The Bible tells us in Malachi chapter 3, speaking of the Messiah, starting in verse 2, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. 
and he shall sit as a refiner and the purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So when Jesus is looking at the church, he's coming in looking to purify the church. He wants the church to be righteous because that's what we were designed to do. So when he comes and he looks into your life, he's going to come, even though and we'll see here in a minute, you may be busy doing a lot of great and wonderful things, but Jesus is always going to be in the business of purifying your life. He's always going to be in the business of bringing you up into righteousness because all of us was conceived and brought forth in sin. And in this flesh, we bear the mark of death. Amen. We bear the mark of death. And so Jesus is always about cleaning us up. He's all about making us stronger, putting his righteousness upon us. So he, when he looks into our lives, the eyes of purification, he cuts through all the garbage. I, I, maybe I'm the only one here who has been guilty of self-deception or I've con con convinced myself that I was doing better than I am. Or I've told myself things that weren't true because I didn't want to deal with the reality of my life. But Jesus looks straight through all of that and he gets right through the core of it. How many times do we see that as an example in the Bible? Uh, remember, we talked about this last week when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and he's like, oh, master, you got all these great ones. Nobody could do all this wonderful stuff. Jesus cuts right through it and says, you got to be born again. Cut through all the smoke. All the screens straight to the issue. We talked about this to the woman at the well. She's like, well, I'm a Samaritan woman. You do, why are you talking to me? And Jesus says, you need the water that I give. Straight through it. His eyes are piercing our smoke screens, piercing the facades that we put up, that we put up in front of ourselves supposedly to strengthen ourselves, supposedly to give ourselves protection, but in reality, they put us in prison. And Jesus looks straight through it and says, here's the issue. And just like Nicodemus, just like the woman at the well, just like the church here at Thyatira, you and I, once we're confronted with the piercing gaze of Jesus, we have a choice to make. Will we submit and surrender? Or will we put up yet another wall, another diversion to try to hide behind? In Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of the letter seemed to have had this thought in mind when he penned these words in verse 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open to, his eyes, to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Think about that this morning, church. Jesus said to the church of Thyatira, I am the son of God with eyes of flame of fire. I'm looking to purify. And he says, my feet are like burnished brass. His walk, the structure of his life, is in judgment. Now, I know that's not a comfortable thought for us. We like to think of Jesus as being a little sweet, meek, and mild. And that's true. That's part of who he is. But he's also the judge of glory. And that's the gospel. The gospel is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whosoever believes shall not perish. But those who don't believe him, what? They're lost already. So we have to have the whole message in order for the gospel to have its true impact. So as witnesses for God, we need to tell people, yes, God loves you. But at the same time, God will not put up. He won't tolerate the sin in your life. Not because God hates you. Not because he's trying to destroy you. If God wanted to destroy you, all God would have to do is nothing. Do you understand? God doesn't sit in heaven with a hammer trying to smack you in the head like whack-a-mole. That's not how God plays. If God wanted you to die in destruction, he would just sit back and do nothing, and your own sin would destroy you because you were conceived and brought forth in sin. God did not come to try to, to get people. He came because everybody who was already on this earth was already condemned and on their way to hell. He came to offer us a way out of destruction. So with his eyes of fire, he looks into our lives. He looked into the church to purify the church, to refine the sons of Levi. And for those who won't be refined, the only thing left is judgment. Will you be refined this morning, church? Or will you hold yourself out for judgment? Number two. 
Christ knows the character of his people. Revelations 2, 19. Revelation chapter 2, verse 19. He says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last be more than the first. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. If you look at the list that he itemizes out, he says, I know your works. I know your charity. I know your service. I know your faith. I know your patience. Is that not a wonderful list of qualities? That's a fantastic list of qualities. And then he says, and I know your last works are more than your first works. Not only are you doing well, you're doing more. That's an accommodation any one of us would have. And what that says to you and me is that Jesus knows the intent. He knows what's happening in your life. He sees the things you're doing. He sees your works of patience. He sees your works of faith. He sees you are endeavoring through to do what he wants you. He sees those things. He's not blind to them. He's not ignorant of the things that you do in his name. And there's nothing you'll do in his name that'll be lost. But he comes back and he says to us, he says to the church of Thyatira, he says, don't let your confidences be built on the things that you're doing. Here's the people who are in a, like I said earlier, just imagine yourself living in the business circle of LA or, or New York, where you're used to making things happen. You're used to calling shots and people jumping and you look up and you see billboards, you see buildings, you see houses and streets. You're making things happen. You are making business go round. And it's so easy for us as believers to start doing things and then having confidences in the things that we're doing as if those things will make a difference. I can come here this morning and I can uh, preach to you or, or teach you or show you truths, but unless the Spirit of God is in this, it's just so much noise. Orthodoxy don't save people. That's a fancy way of saying sound teaching won't save you. What saves you is when you come in contact with the Spirit of God. What saves you is when you have a, a, a knowledge, an intimate knowledge of who Jesus is. So unless we bring ourselves into contact with God, we can have a whole lot of religious noise and not a whole lot of life. And God says to the church of Thyatira, I like what you're doing. I like where you're going with this. But this morning, don't put your stock in it. It's almost like a throwback to what he said to the church of Ephesus. Don't forget your first love. Don't forget why you're doing what you're doing. I know you're doing good, but don't forget why you're doing what you're doing. Everybody still with me? All right. All right. You know, I put a star by this note. I asked myself this question. I said, uh, but like the sister churches had forgotten that God was more concerned with their character than anything else they were doing for him. Then I asked myself a question, so I'll ask it to you. What about you this morning? Are you as careful with your character development as you are with your appearances? Do you put as much energy in the character of Christ being developed in you as you do in your appearance and how you present yourself to people? You know, we had a saying, you heard people say it, fake it till you make it. That don't work with God. God's not interested in you faking it till you make it because he's already done everything necessary for you to make it. He just wants you to jest. Amen. Now, let's come to the, to, the, to the rebuke and the action behind the scenes, the rebuke of Christ. He says to them in the rebuke, starting in verse 20, he says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat sacrifices, <clears throat> eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, I gave you a note. You should have that in parenthesis. Uh, those passages of scripture in First Kings talks about the woman Jezebel. But here we're talking about a more of a spirit or a concept. Some people say one way a person or a system. For purposes of our discussion this morning, it really doesn't matter. But let's think about this. The thing that makes Jezebel so dangerous is that she's operating in the church. Outside the church, we expect the devil to be the devil. But what Jesus said here is, is that you're tolerating her in the church. You're tolerating this system of belief or actions or person. You're tolerating it in the church. This person that's teaching you to commit fornication 
Now, fornication is one of those things that has two meanings in the Bible. One is sexual sin straight up, as we know, physical sex outside of marriage. The other one is when you have spiritual fornication, when you are submitting yourselves to a God other than the true God. The Bible refers to that as adultery and fornication as well. So we have this system of belief that's being tolerated. Now, what we have to be aware of, especially in this day and age, when we are exposed to so much teaching, I mean, there's not, we can go on the internet anytime, day or night, and have thousands and thousands of Bible teachers talk to us about what's going on in that book. We can turn on television here, hundreds of different people talking to us about what's going on in this book. Radio, podcasts, I mean, it is everywhere. This church has a, a, a YouTube station. I have a personal YouTube station where I do Bible studies. They're everywhere. But the caution comes back to you. You have to study and know the word of God and not to tolerate this spirit of Jezebel that will come in and teach these seducing lies. So let's look at the scripture here where and Paul gives Timothy a warning here in first Timothy chapter four, verses one through three. Paul writes to Timothy. Now the spirit speak it expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hard iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So Paul says to Timothy, and here we are in in the last days and in this church here, seem to be doing the exact same thing that Paul is cautioning them against. Paul says, beware, look for these false teachers, look for these seducing spirits who are teaching hypocrisies and deceptions. Teach for these things in Colossians, he says, he talks about us setting up rules that, that, that afflict the flesh, but do nothing to move us forward spiritually. So there's so many things that you can be exposed to that you as a believer, you have the responsibility to take it back to the book to be in a trusted circle of believers that you can go back and get counterbalance and say, what do you think about this? Look at the word, study the word, and then more importantly, go before God and ask him to show you the illumination of light and truth of his word. But what happened in the church of Thyatira, whether it was because of political pressure, whether it was because of self-preservation, they didn't want to uh, stir up a mess, because remember, this was also the time when Christians were being killed. They didn't want to stir up a mess that they tolerated this evil. They tolerated the seducing spirit. They allowed it to work within the confines of the church. So you and I, are you tolerating evil in your life? What excuses do you give yourself to allow evil to have a place in your life? This moves us directly into the the next passage of truth, verses 21 through 23, behind the scenes, the actions of the Lord. Now, what I love about this particular, these verses right here, uh, I'm a fan, and some of you guys at the Bible said have heard me talk about this, is the study of the character of God. The Bible is given to us that we can know two things in particular. One, that we can study and understand the character of God so we can know him better. The other one is so we understand our own character so we can know him better. So here we have a glimpse of the character of God. In the midst of this, in this great evil that's taking place, in all this, 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 this seducing, God's character comes to the surface. If you look at it, this is what he says. He says in verse 21, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. Anybody get excited about that but me? How many of you guys glad God gave you space to repent? How many of you guys glad God didn't just come on the scene and whack you like a mole? You know what I'm saying? Because if he'd been whacking me like a mole, I'd be like the cartoon, I have knots all over my head. Because I've messed up a lot of times. But he gave me space to repent. And if we look at the church of fire, Tyra, or we look at the church over time, we'll see that over time, throughout history, we've had these, these epochs of time or history or events that have taken place where members of the church or evils in the church have risen up, whether it's through the Inquisition or whether it's through any other dark phase of, of church history, where God gave the church time to repent. 
And he's given you and I time to repent today of the evils that we find in our own house. And when he comes through here in that Christian center and he finds error, he gives us time to repent. Because he wants us all to walk in righteousness. He moves us toward his heart. Let's go on and look. He said he gave her time to repent. Then it says, and she repented not. Then comes the judgment. He says, behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Even in this, even in the pronouncement of judgment, God says there is a chance for you. If you will only repent. Some of you this morning may be sitting here heavy under the weight of sin. And God is saying to you, repent. I don't want to judge you. God is saying to you, confess your sin. Whether you think it's great or small, confess your sin. I don't want to judge you. Except they repent. And if they don't repent, carry on verse 23, he says, I will kill her children with death. And what's going to be the result of this judgment? All the churches shall know. Shall know what? That he is the one that searches the reins and the hearts. And then in case you're confused or you're worried about the guy sitting next to you, he says, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. He's not going to judge you because of the way your neighbor acted. So how you act. So the church is in a position that where God is saying to the church, there's time to repent. There's a need to repent. You need to get back in line with righteousness. You've allowed this evil to take root in your midst and you need to get it out and get real. And he says the same thing to us as individuals. Don't tolerate the sin. Now, whenever there is evil in the camp and God sends forth judgment, his judgment always has twofold. One, of course, is to judge evil to make it stop. God comes in to make the evil stop. That's one of his purposes. But the other one we find reflected in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 8 and 9, where it reads thus. He says, Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. But when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So the other purpose of God's judgment is to draw people to repentance. One is to stop the evil. God absolutely wants to stop the evil. But then he wants to draw us to repentance. Repentance meaning being in right standing with God. And I love the little nugget that's right in the middle that you'll get this from Friday night Bible study. You'll see this here as something we talked about Friday night. Anybody else catch that? He says, uh, with my soul, I desire thee in the night. And with my spirit, will I seek thee early. Talking about that morning sacrifice in the evening oblation. Talking about walking with God all day long. Amen. Now, that's a different study that we won't go there. Next, that brings us to the encouragement of the faithful. We've talked now about uh, the behind the scenes, how God has first rebuked the church. He told them what was wrong and what they needed to do. And now he comes to encourage the church after he's shown us what he's doing behind the scenes. And that's in verse 24 through 25. It says, but unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none of the burden that which ye already have, hold fast till I come. A couple of things stand out here. One is we see two camps identified. One is that he says unto you and then unto the rest. So there are those who are doing what God wants them to do and there's those who are not doing God, what God wants them to do. And he points out here, he says, which have not the depth, doctor, this depths of Satan as they speak. And this was a, a teaching that was going on in the church by these new secret truths that were coming forth. And you hear people talk about these new super secret things that they're finding in the Bible. Don't trust it. Someone once said, and I repeat it, if it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. Because God said it all already. Okay? Someone brings you some new revelation they just found, just tell them, take it back on the boat it came in on. <laughs> so we're not riding on that one. Let it go. Stick to the book. Amen? Stick to the book. Then he says on, he goes, I will put none of these things on you. I will add none of these things on you. 
that's going to happen. This judgment that God's going to bring on the church, he says, I'm not going to add these things to you. But what I want you to do is I want you to hold on to that which you already have. Now, that suggests two things to me. One is that I, there's a place of peace where you and I as ch God's children can reside. There's a place of security for us, and we'll look at that in a minute. But there's another thing that's revealed by that statement, and that is this, is that you can give up that position. He says, you hold on to that which you already have, which suggests to me that you can let it go. He says, hold on to what you've already got which suggests that there is a possibility that you could do something stupid and find yourself outside that place of peace. But here, Paul gives us a snapshot of what that place of peace looks like. Open your Bibles to the eighth chapter of Romans, please. We're going to look at what this, uh, get a feel for what this talks about when he says we can hold on and rest in his presence. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39 reads thus. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the place of peace that God has called us to dwell in, to hold on to, separating ourselves from the world. Yes, they may persecute us. We may have to go endure all these hard things, but understand, no matter what trial comes in your life, no matter what it looks like, none of this is able to separate you from the love of God, which you have in Christ Jesus. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we come to the sixth and the final point, the promise of reward. Verses 26 through 29, the Lord continues, he says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Of all the commentaries I read through and looked at in this passage and just studied and prayed, I didn't find anything to, to change what I originally perceived that to be, and that is this. It's the promise of victory. As believers, there is no greater prize that you and I could ever have than to have intimacy with Jesus. And this is what he promises us. If we overcome we will have ultimate intimacy with him. You can see a reference for that in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. We will have that intimacy with him, never more to be disturbed, never more to be compromised or put upon, but from that point on, to walk with him undisturbed. Now, the beautiful part about that is you don't have to wait till the end of the world to have that point of blessing. You and I can have that blessing right here, right now, by doing the adjustments that Jesus uh, suggested here to the church of Thyatira, by repenting, by having your eyes open to darkness, embracing truth and light, surrendering and submitting yourself to it. I said when we started, you can have the worship team come back up, please. But I asked you, uh, said to you when we started that I would give you just a checklist as it came to an end. And here's the checklist when it comes to the person of Christ as the Son of God, who's looking at us with eyes of purifying fire and walking with feet of, bra feet of brass in judgment, how do you stand up? How do you stand before him? Are you ready? Are you walking in purity? Is your life ready 
as you stand under the grace of God in judgment. The intimacy that God has with you, what are the things that God is seeing in your life? As he looks through and pierces into the core of who you are, what does God see in you? Are you living a life that counts? Are you standing in righteousness? Are you in right relationship with God? Or are you still hiding behind a wall, a facade? I ask this question, what would Jesus commend in your life? What would be the works that he would commend in your life? Are you living in good works? As, John, as James says, you show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. What are the works of commendation that Jesus would have in your life? What is the rebuke of the Lord? What is the rebuke of the Lord? You know, and this is one of those things, church, I, I really want us to get over our sensitivity to. We joke about it, and I was talking to Sister Becky about it earlier today, is that we ask a question in general, we'll say something like, well, aren't we all sinners? And everybody goes, yeah, we're all sinners, we're all screwed up. Then we say, okay, let's deal with our sin, and everybody pretends they're okay. So what's the rebuke of the Lord for your life? Don't think of the rebuke as necessarily being a negative thing. If you go to a strength coach, he's just not gonna let you do bicep curls because that's what you're good at. He's gonna make you run. He's gonna make you do stretches. He's gonna make you do squats and all those things you hate. He's gonna make you do those things. He's gonna rebuke you because why? He's a strength coach. He wants your whole body strong, not just your, bore, your, your, your arms. So what's the rebuke in your life? What is God telling you to correct and fix this morning? Judge yourself, as Paul says, lest you be judged. You won't have need to be judged of any man. And what is the correction? What is the direction that the Lord is sending your life in right now? What is the change that's moving you forward and upward? What is God asking you to do to make you more like him tomorrow than you were yesterday? To make you more like him today than you were this morning? What is the correction? What is the directive that God has given you in your life? And lastly, do you believe the promise of the blessing? Are you holding on to that promise? Or have you let it slip by as just being one of those religious things that we have and we say and we do? But is it a reality in your life that Jesus is indeed coming again? And when he comes, his reward will be with him. Not a great big generic reward for the church, for you, based on the works that you have done. Are you ready for that day? If you're not, church, it's so easy to get ready. If you're sitting here this morning and you are not a child of God, you have never asked God to forgive you for your sins, this is how easy it is. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you shall be saved. What are we confessing? We're confessing that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross for my sins, and that he rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and his blood shed, pays the price for my sins. If I can believe that, then I am saved. I said earlier that it, it, I felt in my spirit a thought that there would be those in here this morning who was in the battle, who was holding on, but you're fighting a battle and sin is getting a stronghold on you. The message today is for you to not compromise with that kick it out, kick it to the curb as the kids say. Confess that sin and ask Jesus to cleanse you and forgive you. If you're in the position today and you're saying, Lord, I want to go on. I'm ready to move on, Lord. I'm ready to grow up a little bit. The functions are the same. You ask him right here, right now, Lord, do in me the perfect work. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. If you have need for prayer, please join me at the altar. I'll meet you and we'll pray at the altar with you. But don't leave here today, church, if you're not right and you're not ready. But come and ask the Spirit of God to help you. And He's here to deliver you. No matter what your situation is, He has the answer that your soul needs. He will look right through all the screens you got and He'll speak to the need of your heart. All you got to do is listen. All you got to do is listen. And then once you listen and hear, be ready to confess. And upon confession, the burden will be lifted from you. He will take it on himself 
and you'll be free. So if you have need, as we worship the Lord, come and let me pray with you.